Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode. Today, I've got the honor of interviewing one of the best scientific communicators, in my opinion, in the domain of nutrition. So this is Gil Carvalho. He really makes reading scientific papers in nutrition both interesting and bearable. So I've been really grateful for watching his videos. He's been making videos since uh, 2018 on YouTube for his page, Nutrition Made Simple. And he also is very um, often on Twitter on Nutrition Made S3, I believe. So Gil is a uh, half Portuguese, half Brazilian. He's lived in a few different countries, uh, Brazil, Africa. So he's both a medical doctor and has a PhD. So he got his uh, medical degree out in Portugal before moving to the States to finish his PhD. So Gil is a research scientist and now a science scientific communicator, which I believe we don't have enough of in this time where misinformation is so prevalent. So he's published research in various fields, uh, genetics, uh, molecular biology, nutrition, aging, neuroscience. So he's also have, has a few interesting papers, one based on the protein restriction and how it increases lifespan in flies. And he's even got a paper on the nature of feelings in the domain of neuroscience. So I'm a big fan of Gil. I've learned a lot. I've been binge watching through his episodes uh, the last few weeks. And one theme in Gil's videos is to do with heart disease. So cardiovascular disease, which is one of the biggest non-communicable diseases in our world. So. According to the WHO, about 17.9 million deaths annually are attributed to cardiovascular disease. So these are things such as myocardial infarction, so the heart stopping, and strokes. So even strokes are related to, as, and classed as part of cardiovascular, cardiovascular disease. So Gil, thanks a lot for joining. Did I miss thanks, anything? Uh, that, was, that was an awesome introduction. You got a lot of information there. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of startled that all that, all that stuff is on the internet everywhere I've been. It's, it's like, uh, you might, did you find my criminal criminal record on there at any time? No, no, good. That, that, that's good to hear. Really good. Okay. So to just ease the viewers into things, um, cardiovascular disease. So one of the main causes of it is atherosclerosis. So that is quite a difficult word. So could you briefly in your own words as a medical doctor describe what that is? Yeah, atherosclerosis is, is uh, one of the most common diseases and one of the most common causes of death in the Western world, and actually right now in globally. And it's basically the process of plaque formation. So formation of this atheroma plaque in the artery wall, inside, underneath the superficial layer of cells. And uh, essentially what happens is that Specific types of fats called sterols, cholesterol being the most famous, get accumulated inside that artery wall. And then there's a whole cascade of molecular events with oxidation and inflammation and calcification and all of these things. And that essentially leads to the formation of foam cells and uh, this, this structure called a plaque, um, which over time can do two things essentially. It can partially um, obstruct the blood vessel. So the, what's called the lumen, the hole in the tube, uh, by just by the, that growth, that can gradually reduce the size of the blood vessel uh, of the internal diameter. And consequently it can reduce the amount of blood flow going to different places. Uh, for example, if it's in the coronary arteries that feed blood to your heart muscle, you can have angina, you can have heart attacks if it's serious enough. If it's going up to your brain, you can have a stroke. If it's going up to other territories, you can have other issues. Erectile dysfunction is also a, a consequence of atherosclerosis in the, in the arteries uh, going down into the, the penis. So all different manifestations of the same uh, root cause um, and the, 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 the triggering event, the initiating event in all of this is the, what's called the retention of 
these little particles that I, that I think we're going to talk about, basically there are little uh, cargo ships that carry these fats around in our bloodstream. So as we all know, fats and water don't mix very well. So in order to, to, to uh, ship around different types of fat in our bloodstream, nature came up with the solution of these little transporters called lipoproteins. Lipo obviously means fat. So a lipoprotein is just kind of a sphere of fat and protein. And the conformation of that sphere makes it so that the parts of the fat that don't combine very well with water are towards the inside. So it's a very neat way of transporting fats in the blood and not causing any of these problems. So we have different families of lipoproteins traveling around. Some of them people have heard of. Uh, we can go into that if you like. Uh, but basically, the, to, the, essentially, the, 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 the quick answer to atherosclerosis is some of these lipoproteins can sneak into the artery wall. They can get stuck in the artery wall. It's that sticking that is the critical initiating step. And then when they get stuck, it kind of triggers this entire cascade and that formation of the plaque that can cause the obstruction. And then also there's another, another key uh, a bad event, in addition to the obstruction of the vessel, actually something that is even worse is if there's rupture of the plaque. If it, if it bursts and then there's bleeding into the, into the vessel and then coagulation, and that can cause an acute event with an obstruction of a vessel and one of these heart attack or stroke. So that would be a kind of a summary of, uh, of the process. And now we can go into any details that you like. Perfect. So all of this happens in the arteries. So the arteries, a mnemonic I use is the A stands for away. So the arteries are which lead away from the heart. So why does atherosclerosis, from what I've read, not happen in the veins? Is it something to do with like the blood pressure? Yeah, it seems, it seems to, blood pressure seems to be a big factor. So you can get black in veins in certain circumstances, for example, when veins are transplanted to arterial territory. Uh, so one, one way to do a bypass surgery is to, put, to get a, a little piece of a vein and to put it in somewhere where normally you have a, an artery and then you do like a little, uh, a little circuit around the blockage with a vein. And when that's done, in some cases, they have found plaque in veins. So there doesn't seem to be anything fundamental that prevents plaque from forming in the veins, nothing about the structure of the veins that would prevent the process, but it seems to be about the nature of the blood flow in the arterial territory. And yeah, I think the blood pressure being higher in the, the arteries is a very likely factor. The, what's called the rheological properties is basically the properties of the blood, the blood flow uh, tend to be more turbulent around bifurcation areas. So plaque is often seen around these areas of bifurcation where one, one uh, vessel branches off the other, and it's in those points that you often see it. And that seems to have to do with, with precisely the, the nature of the blood flow. It's more turbulent, it's multidirectional, and there's some really interesting work, but it's still kind of suggestive that there might be some signaling factors that are uh, produced by the by the endothelium, these cells on the surface of the of the blood vessel, on the on the that line the artery wall, that would perhaps produce these signaling molecules, that would in, uh, inhibit the lipoproteins from getting in too much, but this turbulent blood flow would maybe inhibit the production of that signaling molecule, and that would allow then the lipoproteins to to get in more in those areas. That's a little speculative. Still, there's some there's work, some work done that suggests this, but it's mainly what's called mechanistic work. So it's like in cell culture. It's not really like in living, breathing humans. So we take it with a grain of salt. But the bottom line is, yeah, it's, there's, it seems to be primarily about the characteristics of the blood, of the arterial blood flow, specifically in certain areas of arteries. And... What's very well known is that, for example, blood pressure is a is clearly an aggravating factor. So people with high blood pressure, with hypertension, have higher cardiovascular risk, higher risk of atherosclerosis and atherosclerotic events like heart attacks. 
Uh, it's not necessary, so you can have normal blood pressure and still have these events, but it certainly increases your risk. So this is why they probably call uh, call heart disease a multifactorial disease because there's so many factors. So a blood pressure, so a high blood pressure usually above like systolic 120 milligrams of mercury, I think, depending on the country, is when 140 in 140, general. 140 yeah. systolic and 90 diastolic is considered high. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean it's a little bit, it's a little bit arbitrary, right? It's a little, it's not that binary. It's a little bit more of a gradual increase in risk. But yeah, that's the convention is 140 over 90 would be hypertension. Yeah. So this is why it's also important to manage your blood pressure and your BMI. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, okay. all, the, all these risk factors, blood pressure, healthy body weight, glucose levels, diabetes is a big aggravating risk factor as well. Um, some people would throw in things like stress and sleep. The, the, the American Heart Association has this little icon that's made for the public where they, they call it Life Simple. It used to be Life Simple 7, and now it recently changed to Life, Life Simple 8 because I think they added sleep to it as another, another factor. Um, inflammation, if people have generalized inflammation, certain inflammatory conditions, that can raise cardiovascular risk as well. So, yeah, like you said, multifactorial, like most of these chronic diseases of the Western world, there's multiple factors that affect it. Yeah. Okay, so if we then go back to these little particles that you mentioned, so in terms of blood work, so the gold standard from what I've read used to be something known as LDL, so these particles coming potentially from like the liver um, where they're carried out uh, around the body. So LDL was the gold standard because it measures like the, the total amount of uh, of how much LDL you have. So it was measured in, it's measured in milligrams per deciliter. So from what I've read in the books, they say that below 70 milligrams uh, per deciliter of LDL is what you want to be aiming for. And then, but recently in, in the literature, I've been reading a lot about another metric known as APOB. So APOB, from what I've gathered, Rather than LDL, which just measures the total amount of cholesterol you have, uh, APOV measures the number of particles. So could you briefly explain what is LDL and APOV? Because I don't think I did a good job of explaining it, and I'm sure you'll, you'll do a better job. Mostly, no, I mean, mostly you did, especially, especially the APOV part. With the LDL, there's a little uh, complicating factor here with the language, because scientists don't, are not good at coming up with these names. I don't think they, they're thinking of the population when they when they do. And so a lot of times these names are, are a little cryptic and a little confusing. So there's LDL and there's LDL cholesterol. And they're not the same thing. That's that's where scientists suck at coming up with names, right? So if we go back to the the lipoproteins, the, the lipoproteins that we were talking about, there's a couple of different family. There's two different major families. One of them are essentially the HDL particles, which people have heard of, and that's high-density lipoprotein. And the other family has a couple of different types of lipoprotein in it. Now, they, all, of those, all of those lipoproteins in the second family carry a protein on the surface called ApoB, which is short for apolipoprotein B. So this lipoprotein is like a tag or like an identification badge, right? So by, by measuring that, you can see how many of these ApoB-carrying lipoproteins you have. And what's important is that it's the ApoB family that's atherogenic, that raises risk of cardiovascular disease. So the HDLs don't. The, the HDLs are not thought to be atherogenic. They don't stick in the artery wall, and they, they, they don't raise risk of heart disease. Okay, so in, the, in this ApoB family, we have a couple of different types of lipoproteins. So we have VLDLs, very low density lipoproteins. We have IDLs, intermediate density lipoproteins, and we have LDLs, low density lipoproteins. So LD, when we say LDL, normally when people say LDL in general, what they're talking about is LDL cholesterol, but in lipidology in, in, in this field, when you say LDL, you're talking about the lipoprotein. So the little sphere 
that travels around and has ApoB on the surface, right? Okay. Now, what is LDL cholesterol and HDL cholesterol? Because those are different things from HDL and LDL. I think you mentioned that it's the, it's the mass of cholesterol carried inside these transporters. So when we talk about LDL cholesterol and when you have your blood work, when you go to the doctor and you get your little uh, lipid panel, we all get it. It What it shows is the, is the lipids, LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, triglycerides. These are the lipids, the fats being carried inside the particles. So LDL cholesterol is the amount of cholesterol being carried inside all the LDLs. HDL cholesterol is the amount of cholesterol being carried inside all of the HDLs. Total cholesterol is all of the cholesterol being carried in all of the lipoproteins. So that's a kind of an explanation. Let me know if that's clear, the distinction. That's clear, that's clear okay. for me, yeah. That's why, yeah. L, uh, LDL is measured in milligrams because it's a total mass. It's not measured in, as a frequency, so number of particles. Is that? Yeah, so LDL cholesterol is measured in milligrams per deciliter. Uh, in the in certain countries, in others, it's millimole per liter. Um, so it depends on the country. So that's a little, another little confusion, depending where you are. In the U.S., it's milligrams per deciliter, but I think it's in Canada and certain European countries, it's millimoles per liter. Um, so there are some some other con confusing things there, but essentially what you're looking at is the is the amount of cholesterol carried inside your LDL lipoproteins. Now, why does that matter? Most of the evidence points to the critical factor being the number of these ApoB particles. So. The more ApoB carrying lipoproteins you have, the higher your risk, everything else being equal, right? And it's pretty much a straight line. When you look at genetic studies, pe people with different levels of ApoB determined genetically, it's, it's a, I mean, as close to a straight line as you pretty much ever get in biomedical science from something that's like a human study. It's kind of stunning. So the higher, ApoB, the higher your, your concentration of ApoB, the higher your cardiovascular risk. The reason that LDL cholesterol correlates with risk is probably because it's a surrogate. It's an indicator of the number of, the, of those lipoproteins. In general, the more LDL lipoproteins you have, the more cholesterol you're going to have carried inside them, right? In general. There are exceptions, but in general, that's the case. If, if, you have, if I have twice the LDL cholesterol that you have, probably I have more LDL particles. And because LDL particles, we talked about all the different ApoB particles, VLDL, LDL, et cetera, and there's a couple others that we didn't mention. But about, in most people, 90 to 95% of the, of the ApoB particles are LDL types. So that's why LDL cholesterol is a decent, not perfect, but a decent surrogate of risk, an indicator of risk. And in general, people with higher LDL cholesterol will have higher ApoB and will have higher risk. There is, I sh probably should mention that there is still some lingering uh, debate and uh, some people who work in this field still believe that it's about the cholesterol and not the number of particles. But overwhelmingly, the evidence and most of the lipidologists are lined up on the side of the particles being the critical factor and, the, and the, the content of the particles, the lipids being the indicators, the reflection. Um, so, yeah, let me know. That was a long uh, explanation, but these are kind of, these, these can be confusing terms. So let me know if that's clear. It's clear, but something which is uh, still a little bit not clear is the unit. So you said L LDL can be measured in milligrams and moles. So from what I studied in chemistry, moles is... Uh, it's a frequency, so it's how much of something you have, whereas milligrams is like a mass. Right. So you basically, because you can convert, right? Because you know the mass of each molecule, so you can readily convert. And in fact, if you Google, um, if you Google cholesterol conversion or ApoB conversion, you'll find all kinds of pages that have little fields. You can just put in, if you get, for example, you're reading in millimoles or in milligrams, you can just put in that reading. It will automatically give you the reading in the other thing. 
Uh, for ApoB, for example, right, we know exactly how much a molecule of ApoB weighs. Um, well, the ApoB that's in most of these particles. There is there is another particle that's got a small uh, smaller size, but for most of them, for the vast majority, ApoB is like a standard same size molecule. So uh, it's a ready conversion. Like you, if you know the milligram, you know the millimole. Perfect. That yeah makes a lot more sense to me now. Thanks for clarifying that. So. Uh, if we talk a little bit more about ApoB, so ApoB, as you said, is probably the, the best uh, standard to measure heart disease risk. So how much does lowering ApoB actually improve, uh, well, reduce absolute risk, for example, so the total risk? And then does ApoB also follow like the Bradford Hill criteria? So there's this Bradford uh, Hill criteria with regards to causation. So there's like, I think seven or eight criteria, such as like a dose response. So the more of something you have, the greater the effect. So if you remove it, then the heart disease will go away. But this is impossible to basically investigate. So yeah, would you be able to answer these two questions? Yeah. The one factor that's a little complicating and a little annoying is that historically, most trials looked at LDL cholesterol as an indicator of risk, not ApoB directly. For historical reasons, this is how it started back in, back in the 80s in Framingham and all that. They used to look at LDL cholesterol. And that's also why most people in the basic lipid panel contains LDL cholesterol, but not ApoB. So this is how kind of it started. And gradually, over the over the decades, the evidence mounted that it's ApoB that's more more critical. So most of the evidence, if you look at the randomized clinical trials of statins, for example, they they mostly look at uh, changes in LDL cholesterol. Uh, so those I remember from memory because those are like standardized, and it's a reduction of um, thirty eight points. If you if you're if you're in a country where it's milligrams per deciliter, it's about thirty eight points which is, is one millimole per liter. So a reduction in 38 milligrams per deciliter uh, is associated with a uh, 25, 20, 20 to 25% 20 reduction in relative risk. Now, this is over four to five years, which is the, duration, the average duration of these clinical trials. This all, this all varies because it depends on the magnitude of the, the reduction of the LDL cholesterol, or it will be, and it depends on how long you are exposed to it. So these factors are cru crucial, right? If we just throw out a, a value, it means very little. You have to know how long you're exposing yourself to it and how long you're reducing it for. So the, just to give you an example, the reduction over this average time of the, the, the trials is 20 to let's say 20, 22% relative risk reduction per millimole per liter, which is 38 points, 38 milligrams per deciliter. When you extend that to the lifetime, which you can ex extrapolate from the trials and you can also see the genetics, people who are born with lower levels, it's about three, two to three times higher, let's say 50%, 50% reduction in risk um, per millimole per liter or 38 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, over the lifetime. So then how much is that in terms of absolute risk? That depends on the specific population you're looking at, right? It depends on the baseline risk. So if you take, this is very commonly misunderstood. So if you take a population that's pretty healthy and you follow them for five or 10 years, like if you take young people, 25 year olds that are fairly healthy or even that are not that healthy, but 25 year olds and you follow them for five years, you're going to see almost no heart attacks in the control group. So the reduction in absolute risk is going to be close to zero because there is no, there's no risk to be reduced in the first place, right? Whereas if you're looking at lifetime risk, then we're talking about a much higher uh, rate. of so, so it depends on the baseline prevalence of, of the disease. But yeah, so it depends completely. If you're looking at a population, for example, um, over a lifetime in a Western population where heart, where heart disease is incredibly common and heart, and heart attacks are incredibly common, and you're looking at a 50% reduction per millimole per liter, that would revolutionize healthcare if you can do that at a societal scale. Um, and and the higher 
the higher the baseline levels, the the more potential benefit. Because you know, if you're if your LDL cholesterol is 120 and you lower it by 40 points, that's a potential uh, twofold reduction over the lifetime. But if you're starting at a at 200 or 300, then you have potentially a several fold reduction over the long term. So you know, it, it's it's uh, these are enormous benefits that we're potentially talking about. Um, and and to, just to reiterate what we talked about earlier, it's a multifactorial disease, so other risk factors matter as well and can have a huge effect. Also, you know, diabetes can have a huge risk-increasing effect, uh, blood pressure, very very substantial as well, and they tend to be additive. So if you have high, high lipids and di diabetes, it's like additive, if not exponential. Blood pressure on top of lipids, same thing, right? So, yeah, this all gets compounded. Okay, so just for anyone who may have switched off, because uh, <laughs> it's, it's very technical, we're talking about APOB is the total uh, number of atherogenic particles in the bloodstream. And so we talked about all these other risk factors, uh, Gil. Is it possible to, for example, have perfect APOB? So I don't know what your view is, what is a good value of a perfect APOB to aim for? Is it possible to have a good APOB whilst not managing other risk factors for heart disease? So could you have like an ideal APOB but be overweight, for example, or have a high blood pressure above uh, 140 milligrams of mercury? Uh, in terms of what is a perfect APOB, depends who you ask. Uh, different, different doctors and different uh, people say different things. I think um, from what I've asked, under 80 milligrams per deciliter for ApoB is a decent, not too extreme thing to shoot for if you are not at high risk. So if you don't have a lot of other risk factors, if you don't have a history of heart disease, if you don't have like a crazy family history, um, yeah, it's a decent range to shoot for. Some people would, would say even lower, but I think that's a like a... a user-friendly range to, to go for like a, as a minimum bar. Now, if you're talking about somebody at high risk, somebody who, who's, for, for example, secondary prevention, somebody who's already had a heart attack and is trying to avoid another event, you would definitely push it lower, right? That's where you go in with medication, like you try to push that lower to reduce risk more. Now, your question was, can we have great ApoB levels while the other risk factors are a mess? Or, or low, I mean, so like... Or low, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's possible. It depends a little bit on genetics also. So some of the other risk factors will affect ApoB. So, for example, body weight has an effect on lipids. So, um, you know, if, you, if obese people tend to have worse lipids in general than normal uh, body weight people. So that, in general, will, will worsen your lipids and will raise your ApoB. Um but if you're genetic, if you have great genetics and you're born with just you know you, you win the genetic lottery and your ApoB is amazing, yeah, I'm sure there are people that that smoke and have high blood pressure and all these things and have great ApoB and 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 get away with it. Um, another thing that that should be mentioned is that most of these risk factors have other effects as well. So even if you even if you had just just this bomb ApoB that you were born with. And your, you know, your risk of heart disease is is on the floor. It would st you would still not advise someone to be obese and smoke. And obviously, for smoke, you have risk of cancer that is not determined by ApoB. Uh, but you know, all of these risk factors would have other other effects elsewhere in the body. So you wouldn't still wouldn't advise someone to be to be diabetic and uh, morbidly obese or or have sky high blood pressure, even if their ApoB is great. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, just the level of ApoB, yeah, you could have it great with the other risk factors being out of whack. In theory, yeah, you could. Yeah, anything's possible, but it's a team game. So if I talk a little bit now, perhaps, about what I've learned from your videos. So in terms of cholesterol, you've, you've had a good uh, video with Thomas Dayspring where you talk about, um, like, hyper-responders. So not everyone reacts to dietary cholesterol the same. So some people, they can eat 40 eggs, for example, and have little effect on their cholesterol. 
well, so, some people with like particular uh, genotypes may let more cholesterol in through, I think it's like the Neiman Pick uh, brush border or something like this here he mentioned. So everyone is extremely uh, in, in, well, different in terms of how they react to food. So I think that's also a big uh, factor worth considering. And then you've also talked a lot about uh, saturated fats in your video. So there is like, as you mentioned early on, some nuance to it. So saturated fat in the literature seems to have like an S-shaped curve. So risk only seems to rise after a certain amount and after it then levels off. So once you're eating a lot of saturated fat, the risk doesn't really change. So my question is, do you have like a mechanistic explanation for why saturated fat raises uh, risk for heart disease? So in schools, uh, they used to teach me saturated fat is solid at room temperature, so it blocks your your heart vessels. So I don't think this is the case. I've read somewhere that it could be to, to do with like blocking LDL receptors. So what is your yeah. feeling? Yeah, yeah. The, the the first one, the the the, the myth one is a common question. Sometimes, sometimes people say, oh, is it because it's solid at room temperature that it blocks your arteries? <clears throat> um, so saturated fat, it doesn't block your arteries directly. It's not the saturated fat itself that plumps up the artery. Uh, it's the second thing that you said. So the main, the main mechanism appears to be that intake of saturated fat above a certain level, not most, if not all, all whole foods contain some some level of saturated fat. Even lettuce and kale contain some. It's just very low amounts. <clears throat> so it's a, a diet very rich in specific types of saturated fatty acids. For the most part, it's going to be your the butters and the fatty meats and the tropical oils, those foods, and then also ultra-processed foods that contain saturated fat. Those foods, if, if eaten in large amounts, um, will tend to, exactly as you said, the saturated fat um, reduces the number of, of LDL receptors on the surface of the liver. And this circle, circles back perfectly to what we were talking about with the ApoB lipoproteins. So these, these lipoproteins are in circulation, and their level in circulation is determined by a few things. And one of the main determinants is their removal, the rate of removal from circulation, which determines their residence time in, in the plasma. And that's largely controlled by, by these LDL receptors, these little antennae that sit on the surface of the liver cells and bind to these particles and pull them out of circulation. So the more of these antennae you have, the more of ApoB particles are going to be removed and the lower that the level is going to be. And saturated fat, by reducing the amount of the antennae, causes these particles to stay in circulation longer, their concentration goes up, and risk goes up. So that's that's the main mechanism that's thought to mediate it. There are some others that are floated um, but have less evidence for them, maybe an effect on, on coagulation, maybe an effect on lipopolysaccharides. Those are a bit more speculative, but this is the, the main one that uh, has been documented. Mm -hmm. And something else you've talked about is even like the nuance within the saturated fat. So you said that certain types of saturated fat, such as I think, was it coconut oil you mentioned in your video, may raise uh, risk less? Um, ste ste I think you might be referring to stearic acid. Yes. It's rich in uh, dark chocolate. Mm, yeah, that's the one. Chocolate. Yeah. Yeah, that's like the, the, the stereotypical type of saturated fatty acid that is like an exception um, because it's, it doesn't seem to raise LDL cholesterol, it doesn't seem to raise ApoB, and it doesn't seem to associate with risk either. So, it, and that's concentrated, for example, in dark chocolate. So dark chocolate is technically very high in saturated fat. It's just a, a type of saturated fatty acid that doesn't seem to cause problems. Okay. Oh so yeah, it's, it's, it gets a little bit complicated. There's, there's basically a whole gamut of saturated fatty acids, and it's really three that uh, that seem to raise cholesterol and raise risk. Uh, it's meristic, lauric, and palmitic are the, the three main mm -hmm. culprits. Okay, I need to check then what's in the coconut. Uh, yeah, coconut oil? Uh, 
I forget exactly which one it is. I, it might be Lorik. We could we could look it up. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I forget which one it is, but it's it's very high in saturated fat, and it's one of these. I, I want to say Lorik because palmitic is is for palm oil, so I want to say Lorik, uh, but I could be wrong about that. About which one of the three is high in coconut oil? We'd, we'd have to. So, so have to it, yeah. would you say it's well, from what you remember more likely to increase risk? This the one in the coconut oil. So with coconut oil, there's a little bit of uncertainty because there's, there's, I think, pretty convincing evidence that it raises LDL cholesterol relative to other foods that are more unsaturated uh, forms of fat. But I haven't seen um, any, like, data on risk itself. So you typically want to see also at least the association between intake of, saturated, of, of the food and the the effect on actual risk of cardiovascular disease. And I don't remember seeing any out. It's, so it's called an outcome data when you look at the actual risk. I don't remember seeing any for coconut oil specifically. I don't know if, if it's out there. So it's kind of presumptive. It's kind of because it raises the level of the lipids and because it's the same type of, of saturated fatty acid, presumably it will raise risk. But I, I think it's fair to say the certainty is a little lower than for other foods that have been directly tied. Mm. I've read about the dark chocolate that you mentioned. I've also seen that it's high in like polyphenols and like phytonutrients, which can really uh, also help to reduce risk. And uh, yeah, I think you're raising a good point, which is the package, right? With the and I mean, anytime we talk about saturated fat, this this has to be brought up. The effect of a food is much more than the effect of one component. So yeah, you ha you ideally you have to look at the effect of a of an entire food on health and the entire dietary pattern even, because some foods when we focus too much on an on an isolated nutrient, it can generate misunderstandings. So for example, people will say, well, nobody should eat any fish because it's got you know a, a decent amount of saturated fat, or nobody should eat any olive oil because it's got a substantial amount of of all of saturated fat. But both of those foods contain a lot of unsaturated fats. In the case of olive oil, monounsaturated. In the case of fish, polyunsaturated. And so it's that balance that causes, that determines the effect on lipids and, and the effect on risk. So, yeah, we should never forget that it's the effect, the, the, the net effect of the food and the, and the dietary pattern that, that counts at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Like no one food will uh, seriously hurt you, I guess, in moderation. But yeah, uh, you, yeah that's, that's, Probably a defensible statement if you have a, if you have a dietary pattern that overall is health promoting that is pretty well designed. If you have pretty much, I think I, I think we could say any food you could be included. The key is going to be amount, right? But you could include any food as long as it's not a very large amount without it substantially changing your risk. I think that's a defensible statement. <laughs> So something else in your videos that you've talked about is substitution. So looking at what is being substituted for what. So some studies, uh, such as the pure study in one of your videos, it compared what would happen when saturated fat was replaced with, um, for example, I think it was actually looking at refined carbohydrates and then the risk went up. Whereas other studies which compare saturated fat substitutions to more um, complex carbohydrates, such as I think uh, maybe like brown rice or even like uh, polyunsaturated uh, fatty acids, so vegetable oils or monounsaturated fatty acids, such as in the olive oil you mentioned, this reduces risk. So... I think would the statement be that that you need to look at what you're replacing it with be a valid Absolutely. statement? Absolutely. Absolutely critical. Uh, so what you're very uh, importantly touching on uh, with, with pure, uh, they, the, their main analysis didn't specify a replacement. And then they had a, a, a later figure where they look at replacement of saturated fat with carbohydrate in general. The problem with that is that in most populations, when you don't specify the type of carbohydrate, it tends to be low quality carbohydrates, like refined grains and, th and added sugar and things like that. So what's been 
teased apart in these studies that looked at specific uh, replacements is exactly what you said. So, for example, replacing saturated fat isocalorically, so the same number of calories, uh, with low-quality carbs, like refined grains, for example, there's no significant change in risk there. Uh, and if and if you, for example, look at replacing saturated fat with trans fats, there might even be an increase in risk. So they might they might even be worse for you, uh, uh, calorie for calorie. And uh, exactly as you said, the replacements for unsaturated fats, especially polyunsaturated fat, and also to an extent, uh, whole carbohydrates from whole grains, for example, tend to to associate with a reduction in risk. Um, and this is. To some extent, the, the, the randomized control trials uh, point in the same direction, especially for PUFAs, it's suggestive of the same thing. It's harder to say for, from the RCTs because there's less of them looking at, for example, replacing with carbs. It's a little more murky, but the balance of evidence, yes, points to, to the replacement being absolutely critical. When we don't specify what we're replacing it with, it's incredibly confusing. When we look at it, a population, especially Western, but it, but pretty much in general, and we don't specify the replacement, it tends to be low quality carbs and you tend to see not see, to not see much of a difference. And when you look at a replacement with one of these foods that you listed, you tend to see a reduction in risk, provided it's in, it's in a certain substantial amount. So that's the balance of evidence, yeah. Okay, perfect. So I think if someone was looking to switch their calories then from saturated fat to a more healthy alternative, the good options would be monounsaturated fats such as olive oil or poofers, so these uh, vegetable oils or even complex carbs. But I came across a paper a couple of days ago which said that if you substitute fat for poofer, it has a slightly modest um, improvement uh, compared to complex carbs. Uh, in terms of what? In terms of cardiovascular risk? Uh, I, I believe so, yeah. So if you substitute the saturated fat for polyunsaturated fatty acids compared to substituting it for complex carbohydrates, the overall... Uh, yeah, most, of the, most of the evidence, I think, is would, would argue the opposite, that the strongest benefit tends to be replacing with polyunsaturated fats. In these substitution analyses, you tend to see the strongest effect with PUFAs. Yes, that's and, what I meant. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, yeah. yeah. And also in the RCTs, that's the one that has the best, uh, the direction of the evidence is, is strongest for PUFAs as well. But, so those could be fatty fish. They could be um, nuts and seeds. They could be other vegetable oils. Some people like to include oils. Some people prefer not to. That's a personal thing. Uh, but those would be some examples of foods that would, in general, so going a little bit from the fatty meats to maybe a fatty, a fatty fish like um, salmon, for example, a couple of times a week, um, you know, replacing maybe maybe the butter or, you know, it doesn't have to be a complete replacement, but it, but it may be a, a partial replacement. It depends on how much you're eating at baseline, but mm. uh, the butter with vegetable oil or with something else, that peanut butter, I guess, if people are using it as a spread. Um, those would be some some ideas off the top of my head. Perfect. So in your videos, you've also given a range of other lifestyle factors people can employ to reduce their risk of uh, heart disease, such as soluble fiber, uh, plant protein, nuts and seeds, as you already mentioned, avoiding trans fats. Again, we've touched upon today. So even just dietary habits. So following a more like a Mediterranean style diet, for example. So what about if people go to the shop and they're, they're buying a product? Uh, so maybe salt and fat is something they should keep an eye on. So the, there's the traffic light system, which recommends for, I think it's 0 0.3 grams um, per 100 grams for salt. So the, the, the daily recommendation for salt is around 5 to 6 grams uh, of uh, salt. And about which weight works out about like two to 2.4 grams of sodium because salt also raises um, uh, blood pressure and hypertension. So people would want to limit their salt consumption. But generally, if people cook themselves, it's quite hard to go overboard on salt. So it's more the salt in the food products they buy. So 
what would your recommendation be for salt? And then what I read for fat, so in terms of the traffic light system around less than three grams of total fat per 100 grams or less than 1.5 grams of saturated fat per 100 grams is something to aim for. I don't know, have you looked into this, into like shopping habits, what would be a good option? Okay, so, uh, so salt f first, right? Um... Yeah, what you said is essentially uh, the, the general recommendations are five grams of salt as, as kind of the cap and try to try to stay under that, which is not a lot. It's like a teaspoon or something like that. Um, but what you said is absolutely correct, that the vast majority of, of sodium in uh, Western diets is coming from uh, ultra processed foods, not from the salt that people are adding to the plate or to the or to the cooking. So that's the main concern there. Um, so going a little easy on those and, and substituting with food with meals cooked at home would be kind of a, a, a type of advice that pretty much nobody would disagree with in terms of, of uh, public health. Um, another kind of little tweak or, or a little life hack, there are some salts that are uh, potassium chloride instead of sodium chloride. And those two ions tend to have a uh, an antagonistic effect. So the potassium chloride actually lowers blood pressure. Uh, so that's one option. And there's actually several types in the market. Some are partial so that you'll have, you might have, for example, 50% might be sodium chloride and 50 potassium chloride mixed in the salt. Others are 100% potassium. Some people don't like the taste of potassium chloride and so they prefer to have a mix I don't notice a difference, so I don't care. I have I, we have some potassium chloride. It was mainly for my for my um, mom and some family members who have issues with with blood pressure, but that's an option. And actually, there are some really interesting trials uh, in China where they replaced the sodium, the regular salt, with the potassium chloride, and they had some some really impressive results in terms of not just lowering blood pressure, but lowering events of cardiovascular disease and, and even death after several years of the swap. So it's kind of an incredible little swap, just sw swapping the type of salt that you use. And for some people, you might not see much of a difference, notice notice much of a difference. And yet the effect on health can be quite uh, impressive. Um, and then the, the, the other question you asked was about saturated fat. Mm -hmm. um, normally in terms of numbers, normally the range that that is recommended is to try to stay under 10% of our calories coming from saturated fat overall. Um, there's some, some wiggle room there, but that's the ballpark. Uh, most of that is going to, is going to be the switches that we already talked about in terms of, of food types. But yeah, if people are getting a lot of ultra processed foods that are high in saturated fat, yeah, that could be, absolutely be a, a big source as well. So um, I'm not, Super familiar with the different types of, of, of processed foods out there and the content of saturated fat. Um, but that would be a good idea to, to either to, I mean, ideally you want to move away from ultra processed foods and replace with whole foods, right? So in a perfect world, that's what people would do. If that's not possible, I would say go for the healthiest ultra processed food that you can find. And yeah, all else being equal, if it's lower in saturated fat and sodium, that's beneficial. Um, but with ultra processed foods, there are so many moving parts that there might be other things that are that are in the mix that are that might make make it problematic as well. So yeah, that's a, that's a, like a whole different world. Uh, if you have specific examples, I mean, we can maybe look at them. Um, but yeah, I think those are some re reasonable kind of general tips. Yeah, I agree. So. It, it costs nothing to really switch from saturated fat to uh, something more healthy. It's just simple swaps you can implement. So it's not really uh, something which takes uh, too much trouble. You just need to be aware of it. And uh, yeah, a figure I hear is less than 30 grams of saturated fat, but yeah, I don't see no reason just to minimize it as much as possible. And then back to the, the, the salt you were talking about, the potassium chloride, in one of my lectures, I actually had to design an intervention against like um, hypertension, and I recommended like 
like uh, I think it was like compulsory potassium chloride by the, the lecturer. He, he, he mentioned the taste, like some people don't like the taste of the potassium chloride, but you have another great video on that, I believe. So I'll, I'll put all the links to your videos so people can get all of these actionable tips and yeah, watch the videos later. So the, so that on that, there, there are some studies and it varies from person to person. Some people find a metallic taste and some people, I, for me, I don't, I don't notice a difference. Um, but that, that, that tip of, um, of titrating helps. So they've done that too. They've, they've t given people, so maybe for people who are sensitive, who do notice a difference and don't like it, if you have a salt that's 100% potassium chloride, they might frown upon that. But, but if it's 50-50 uh, or if it's 40-60, then they, then they totally tolerate it or, or even don't notice a difference. So that, that's a, um, one, one way to go. The other thing that's worth mentioning is that if people have kidney issues, um, it, it might be worth uh, taking, keeping an eye out because you don't want to overload the system with potassium. It can be a problem for people with kidney, uh, with chronic kidney disease. So that's something to, to bear in mind for that population. Okay, cool. So uh, something else I like to do is uh, without even using salt, I can basically replicate the taste of salt. So like I can add some nutritional yeast that's got sort of got a salty flavor, it replaces it, or even some vinegar or lemon. That can be a tip to reduce the, the, well, the need for adding too much salt. But I live in Switzerland where the salt is iodized. And so that's a big source of people, uh, iodine here. So I'd recommend still people to uh, cook using some salt. So the teaspoon will probably get their iodine. Because before Switzerland, they had a big problem with goiter because there was like ice sheets here and it swept away all of the iodine. So the iodine, um, which is very important for the thyroid gland, is not present in the soil anymore. So that was a big public intervention they did. That's here. a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. If people go 100% whole foods and 100% no salt in a lot of cases it depends right so dairy is another common source of iodine because of the way they wash like the vats it's a whole thing but but for people who are in these very like pure pure diets and trying to be 100 percent, and sometimes they're they're like vegans and they don't admit any salt yes it's uh, it's worth thinking about iodine which a lot of times comes from from the salt and so there's a couple options you can try to get um, like you said, you can just still try to include some salt and just not go overboard. And that's fine for people who don't have high blood pressure. Uh, there are salt supplements. There are other sources as well. So it's a good, it's a good point. Uh, and then you said something earlier that I was, that I, that I was going to weigh in on bef right before that. I forget what it was right before the, right before the iodine. I talked uh, about nutritional yeast, uh, lemon, uh, vinegar. Oh, uh, yeah, it's probably, it was probably wasn't too crucial. Okay. Um, so something about, yeah, something about seasoning, maybe. Yeah. That's yeah okay. uh, it, it escaped yeah. me. No, I, I meant like, yeah, using nutritional yeast on seasoning mm -hmm. or vinegar, so a lemon to get a salty sort of, uh, basically just replicate yeah. the salt to add yeah, some sort of flavor. Yeah. Herbs are great. Um, oh, I, I remember what I was going to say. The, the hat, when we are used to um, to the taste of salt, removing it suddenly is incredibly difficult for most people. But there's habituation in the gustatory receptors. So, and I've seen this, I've experienced it myself, and I've seen it in family members. If you do it gradually, your ta your taste completely changes, like dramatically cha changes. I had family members who ate just ungodly amounts of salt their entire lives. And then they, they made this change later in life. And now we give them normal food, right? The food that most people eat and they complain it's too salty all of a sudden. Well, not all of a sudden after a couple, few months or years of this process. So yeah, you can wean it off slowly and just gradually reduce and your own taste will adapt. And you'll find that you get to a point where uh, a food that most people, for most, most people is normal, like, a, you know, potato chips or something like that, it'll start being too salty for you. You'll start noticing it. So it's a, it's totally a matter of habit. Yeah, I agree. The same can, I think also happen with sugar as well. So having less candy after you become, you may become more 
more sensitive because you desensitize like the olfactory receptors. So I don't know if it's been studied, but uh, it's a possible, I think. Uh, yeah. With the salt, with the salt, I know it has. With the sugar, I'm sure it has. Uh, and I'm, and that, that that has to be the case as well. I don't remember off the top of my head studies, but they have to be out there. And with salt, yes, it's been looked at specifically with this desensitization. Uh, you increase the salt and then the person starts, you know, things just become less salty to them over time mm. and, and vice versa. Yeah, this has been looked at. Yeah. But we still need, I think my lecturer told me one gram of salt per day for survival. So just no salt is also not the best option. So like one gram sodium. is time. Uh, yeah, sodium, yeah. Sodium, right? Yeah. Uh, it's an important distinction. So we need some sodium. Um, which can which can come from whole foods. Mm. We don't need salt it added salt in our diet, but it's also not not the case that you have to remove all the salt from your diet no matter what. Like sometimes, you know, different movements on the internet will go too far and will go to these extremes where if you add any salt, you're killing yourself. That's not supported by the evidence. Yeah, the the the, the limit that you talked about earlier is pretty reasonable. Keeping it under five grams of salt or, or two point Three milligrams yeah. of, mm -hmm. of uh, milligrams, I think it is, not not grams. Mm. Uh, I think I think it's two point three. Uh, make look look that up, but it's. Uh, it's I, I think I think it's I think it's, it's two point three grams. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, uh, 23,000 23, uh, or twenty three hundred milligrams. It's two point three grams, correct? So yeah, five grams of salt, two point three grams of sodium. Uh, which can come from some added salt if people prefer. Someone who prefers not to add salt, that's okay too. You're going to get some sodium in your foods. Um, so yeah, those, there's some some leeway there. Interesting. I didn't know that. I thought it, that meant like added salt. I didn't know I couldn't actually get it in the food. So that's good to know because I yeah, the foods to... contain contain sodium. Um, and yeah, I mean, I don't think I don't think we. I mean, clearly we didn't always have salt around, right? Like purified salt to add to foods. So anim animal foods tend to have a bit more sodium than, than plant foods, for example, but it varies also in the types, the types of, but yeah, foods contain sodium, all of them, I, or most of them at least. Okay, perfect. So uh, back to the topic of saturated fats. So you mentioned keeping it under 10% of calories. So if we were going to, if someone basically cannot give up, for example, steak, uh, what would that translate to in terms of like grams of steak? Would it be like less than, would it be less than a hundred grams of steak or? It depends entirely on the cut, right? So fatty versus lean cuts, completely different saturated fat content. Also trimming the fat from the steak. And this is likely to have a big impact on health. So, yeah, it really depends on personal taste, but these are some some general ideas. Like, for example, yeah, you don't have to remove all the red meat from your diet if you don't if you don't like to. That's not. I don't think any health organizations tell people that they have to remove all red meat. Um, but these are some some things that will, in all likelihood, have an effect. It's it's the amount, and then the type. So mm. if you're having steak with a boatload of fat, like the visible fat really fatty cuts, that will have a very different effect on your on your blood lipids to lean cuts of red meat. And this has been shown directly. There's clinical trials swapping these and showing a reduction of, of cholesterol in April B with the leaner cuts. So yeah, that's a, that's a tip for somebody who wants to be, eat a steak and doesn't mind trimming off the, the visible fat. Um, that would probably be a, an upgrade. Because mm. I basically, I've made myself the promise that the next steak I'll have will probably be like a cultured meat steak. So okay. if one will be designed, I don't know if it will have the same like saturated fat profile as a normal steak, but just to know how much, if it comes on the market someday, <laughs> I'm guessing, yeah, it will have, be, have the same considerations, just seeing how fatty the cultured meat steak is and... Yeah, there's, I mean, there's all kinds of question marks with those foods. Like, we, they're just, they just got here uh, in the U.S. The first company just got approved to to uh, grow and I think uh, commercialize uh, 
uh, cultured meat, lab meat. In here in Europe, I don't I don't know if there's any company that's authorized. I don't know. I know there's one in Singapore, but this is just starting. So, and we don't. I mean, we, there's all kinds of um, uncertainties in terms of the, the the effect that these foods will have on biomarkers and risk of disease and uh, the environmental impact. Another big one that people talk about. Um, but this is going to explode. I, I don't have any any doubt that this is going to be in the next 10, 20 years. It's absolutely going to explode, and we're going to have a lot of a lot of evidence gradually mounting which direction it's going to go in. Nobody knows for now, um, and it's guaranteed to be very controversial. All kinds of different opinions, uh, but I think mainly for for the environmental uh, purpose, it's it's. I see this as a as a as a huge um, uh, like a saving a saving resource that we might have because changing dramatically changing dietary habits at a population scale is incredibly difficult. We know that from well everything <laughs> from data from uh, from about, from just public health and, and uh, polls of, of habits. It's it's incredibly difficult for people to sustain a dietary change. But I think this aspect of innovation, of coming up with foods that look the same and taste the same to people, but that have a lower environmental impact could be a big um, salvation here. Because I don't, I don't see how else we're going to solve the environmental problem that we have. Mm, yeah. Today I tried my first uh, cashew cheese. It was like a, a camembert and it was by a company called New Roots. And I checked, I checked out the protein content and it was uh, very good to like 15 or around 15 grams of protein per hundred grams. And it tasted yeah, from what I remember exactly like uh, the camembert cheese. So I think it's uh, moving all in a very positive direction. Yeah, there's going to, there's all kinds of, of uh, options in growing and it's a, it's a booming niche in the market. Cheese is often a complaint by people who, don't want to eat uh, dairy cheese and who want to eat uh, like some kind of plant-based cheese. It's one a complaint that it never, it's never the same. And actually, most people say it's not, it's not even close. Like it's got nothing to do with, with actual cheese. Uh, so that's been a hurdle for these, uh, these companies to come up with a cheese that's actually convincing um, for reasons that are a little bit surprising. Other products have been eaten like a burger for a lot of people that these impossible and, and Tastes the same, but the cheese has been a big, uh, a big challenge. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm sure we're going to keep seeing <laughs> companies try with different products. But this one was very convincing. So yeah, okay. I... thanks a lot, everyone, for tuning in. So let's start to wrap things up. This was the first part of my talk with Gil. Next time, we'll focus more on the health claims I've seen online with regards to heart disease and whether or not they're true or just myths. So Gil is truly an excellent scientific communicator and very unique in the social media domain where we see so much misinformation. Gil always tries to present information in the most objective way, the most objective manner for us, the viewer, to make up our minds on the best ways to go forward given the information available to us. So a lot about what we talked about today was very technical. So unless you're a scientist, it's not going to be very useful to get all wound up about the small scientific aspects, such as how much saturated fat you need to avoid increasing risk. What should be focused on, though, are the key healthy eating habits that Gil has provided in this podcast and in his numerous videos, such as a healthy eating uh, pattern, such as a Mediterranean style diet full of whole grains, legumes, nuts, seeds and healthy oils, such as vegetable oils, um, olive oil and avocados. He also has a number of other tips, such as reducing salt consumption through the use of potassium chloride or just reducing salt intake in general to get our gustatory receptors more used to lower salts. Increasing soluble fiber, which can be found in things such as oats and psyllium husk and avoiding trans fats as we talked about today.
So with regards to the lipids panel, it was also very technical, but the key takeaway is that we should probably look most at APOB, which is probably the gold standard metric, the best marker for heart disease risk. So what we should probably aim for is an APOB of less than 80 milligrams per deciliter. With regards to LDLC, LDL cholesterol, which is probably the second best metric, we should aim for less than 70 milligrams per deciliter. These are probably the optimal values, less than 80 for APOB and less than 70 milligrams per deciliter for LDL cholesterol. So APOB, as we talked about, is the number of these atherogenic particles, whilst LDL cholesterol measures the total amount of LDL cholesterol in your bloodstream. So do not get too worried if your values in, when you do a lipid panel are slightly above. Just focus on implementing the key dietary habits we talked about. And if your blood biomarkers still stay above or elevated above these thresholds that we talked about, you may have to look into medication, which I'll talk about with Dr. Thomas Dayspring in my next podcast next week. So other things to look out for in the lipids panel is the triglyceride value. So the tri triglyceride value has links with diabetes and blood sugar control. And a key uh, number to aim for is less than 150 milligrams per deciliter for your blood triglycerides. If you ever go and do a blood lipids panel to get your uh, heart disease risk checked. So Thomas, Dr. Thomas Dayspring, in one of his videos, which I'll link to the podcast description of this episode, says that we should actually even aim for an even lower value of triglycerides of less than 80 milligrams per deciliter. So have a look at the video. And thanks again for tuning into this podcast episode. I hope you learned something useful and stay uh, connected to look for future podcast episodes. You can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. So thanks again for tuning in. Ciao.